All right, there we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 44, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in the podcast format. This is the first episode of 2019, and uh, well, since it was kind of holidays, we don't really have that many things to talk about, but uh, there are some pretty cool announcements and uh, teasers for the upcoming things, so we're gonna talk about that. Hey Donna, welcome to the stream. All right, so let's get started. As you can see here, we don't really have that many articles or even tiny things, uh, but we do have a bunch of uh, pretty cool new libraries and demos and some interesting stuff that happened over the holidays, basically. So let's get cracking. The first article we've got here is called Improving React Performance Using Lazy Loading and Suspense. And it is a, another tutorial on using React Lazy and Suspense for code splitting and lazy loading your components, pages, or whatever you want, right? Um, if you already know how all of that stuff works, I mean, it's been a while, uh, it's been around for a while. Um, yeah, it's it's nothing really new here, but if you are still unfamiliar with the, you know, lazy loading techniques using React Lazy and Suspense, it's a very good introduction. Uh, it will basically guide you through lazy loading just about everything you want, including the route-based uh, code loading with the, uh, React Router DOM, which is quite nice as I know that some people struggled with figuring that one out. So do check it out. Um, right, the next article we got here is the Chronicles of JavaScript Objects. This is a very detailed introduction to JavaScript objects. So this is a very um, entry level tutorial, let's put it this way. So if you're already familiar with the objects, you know what the objects are, what kind of primitives um, they have, I'm sorry, no, that's not, that's not correct. What kind of what the objects are, what kind of properties they have, what kind of functions uh, are there in the um, standard library of JavaScript to interact with them, and so on and so forth. You know, iterators, protocol, uh, I don't know, comparison, copying, whatever. All of that is here. Like literally everything you want to know about objects is pretty much included. Uh, if you already know all of that, well, you won't really find anything super new here. It's just a really good recap, I guess, of everything uh, existing. It's a very long article and basically has everything. I don't think that I think the only part that it doesn't really talk about is the reflections and proxies, which is well, you know, topic complex enough to be a separate one. But uh, yeah, quite good. So if you are still confused about JavaScript objects do check it out, it will get you started in no time. Next article we got here is infinite data structures in JavaScript. This one talks about, um, well, how to build essentially a small tutorial and then the uh, library that the author made, uh, how to build an infinite data structure, specifically infinite lists um, in JavaScript, right? So it's a, it's a really neat, uh, like if you ever worked with uh, functional languages like Haskell or Clojure or well, just about any other functional programming language, you know that there, you know, one of the core concepts is the infinite lists that or I guess lazy data structures that do not evaluate until you do something to them. So as in you have the take method, for example, that will only execute uh, on the first x entries, right? And this is exactly what the author aims to do here in JavaScript. Uh, hey, not buff, welcome to the stream. And yeah, so the, this is the general idea of the infinite list as in it's infinite and it can contain any number of objects. And the actual actions should only be performed in a lazy way as in, you know, on, on objects that are required. Like for example, if we do take 10, we only perform the any following actions on the first 10. So uh, the way it is achieved is through the iterator pattern when you, you know, you can create the iterator and then iterate over it. So you have the iteration protocol now. And then we combine that with the generators, which mean we can actually generate, um, well, pretty much anything, right? So in this case, there's, for example, the Fibonacci sequence generator. And um, after that, the author extends the whole thing to the lists, like the proper ones with the values and everything, and then implements the lazy execution of taking and mapping and everything, right? So it's quite nice. And as the result of the article is this lazy infinite uh, library, which well, essentially just for the lists, but it is quite neat. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It I would say it's also a quite good introduction to the generators and iterators as well. I mean, you would need to understand the basic concepts of it. But, uh, you know, in a deeper level, this is gives you a quite good uh, intro to them. 
All right, continuing, we got reactivity with RxJS, force press, implementing press and hold using RxJS. So it's, you know, as the title says, it's a pretty basic tutorial on how to do press and hold with, um, oh, come on. Do not freeze now, what, what, my Chrome just, is, it, was it too much for my Chrome? Oh no, oh, there we go, okay. Now it works. I think it's because of one of the demos, which we'll come to later, that takes about one gigabyte in memory and eats the CPU like hell, but it's totally worth it. Right, so um, yeah, so this is how it works. Essentially, if you just press the button once, you will increment or decrement the value. And if you hold it, it will start, you know, counting. And the author shows you how you can implement this, first of all, using um, plain JavaScript, like vanilla JavaScript, right? It's not easy, like you can do it obviously, but it is a bit iffy and reading this code doesn't really make it obvious what the hell is going on here. But um, then the author goes, okay, so we now actually have the RxJS, which is well better suited for something like this. And then he re-implements it using RxJS and it is just way cleaner. So if you were curious on how to implement something like this and you wanted a brief introduction to RxJS because the author does go through the code line by line and basically explains what each line does, which is very handy. And this is a really good introduction. So do check it out. And maybe you can implement the force press in your apps as well. So, and there's also the discussions for, uh, you know, linear non linear exponential, uh, uh, what do you call it? Time scaling, I guess. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for your donation. Uh, thank you for your continued support. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's basically a really neat intro to what the RxJS can do for you uh, UI wise. I, as you might know, I'm a huge fan of RxJS. So do check it out, quite highly recommend it. Next thing we got here is an article from uh, Dr. Gleb Bakhmutov, uh, who is now working on Cyprus. And this is an article that is specifically talking about UI testing as an end-to-end -end testing. So if you've never heard about Cypress, it's an end-to-end -end testing tool. And the article is called Stop Using Page Objects and Start Using App Actions. Um, I honestly never wrote that many end-to-end -end tests and, you know, never had a project that was quite as large to be needing to do something like page objects. But uh, apparently page objects pattern is very sort of standard thing in the UI testing. The idea is that you create a class or an object or whatever that is related to a specific page. And then you create a page specific actions like, you know, find the username, find the password, and then like type username, type the password and so on and so forth. So that when you write a test, it's actually just as simple as create a new page and then type username, type password, and then submit login, and then you expect something, right? Seems quite nice, but um, that means that you actually have to write those page wrappers every time, right? Which is, well, it, it adds an overhead and there's, there's obvious upsides and downsides to this, right? So what uh, Dr. Mahmoudov suggests here is that you actually, instead of writing the wrappers, you switch to, because as you know, as, as, as your test cases get more complex, you'll get a lot more overhead because you would have to define all those crazy commands and patterns that actually should do something, right? So he suggests going into, instead of using the models, using application actions, right? So this is the idea. And um, the idea is that application actions are straight up just functions, which is very much the sentiment that I like um, about functional programming. There was a, a pretty great number of talks uh, including the like kind of, you know, funny, or not a funny ones, sort of on a silly side saying that, hey, the functional programming is actually, you just replace everything with a function. You know, we had classes and uh, object oriented with, now we have just functions, we had data, now we just have functions <laughs> and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, this, this is kind of the same sentiment. There is, obviously I cannot give you all the details of that. There is a ton of nuances, but if you are working on the end-to-end -end testing, do check this out because there is quite a lot of stuff going on and there is some very interesting observations from essentially a person who's working on end-to-end -end testing framework. So uh, quite highly recommend it. Happy birthday uh, from Donna. Thank you very much, Donna. Once again, this is really awesome. And uh, yeah, but once again, thanks for your support. All right, continuing, we got a recursive path with React Router. Um, yeah, this one is crazy. So um, I, I 
kind of expected that you could do something like this with uh, React Router, but I did not know that it was you know, physically possible, basically. So the idea is that you can have recursive routes that uh, guide you through well any nested, well, I mean, they're recursive, right? So you can add them as much as you want. And this article shows you, uh, so essentially it, it um, has the route, which is like user slash ID. And then this ID will render the profile of a user. And the idea is that you can stack them together going from, you know, slash one, slash two, slash three, and so on and so forth. And they will be recursive. And how do you actually implement that? Now, um, the whole exercise is really cool because it's sort of, um, shows how complex can the React router be, like the, the cases that it can handle. Now, the problem with it is that I probably would die from seeing something like this in the real world apps. Um, I, maybe there are some valid use cases for this, but even wrapping my head around this test example, you know, the contrived example that is very basic was hard enough. Um, I think trying to reason about that in a real world application would just kill my brain. But Nonetheless, it's a really cool tutorial and a really cool article showing what you can actually do with uh, React Router and how you can use it to set up even the recursive um, path matching. So it's kind of great. Do check this out. Next article we got here is better reusable React components with override patterns. Uh, and this one talks about, yeah, just as you might imagine, the component reuse and uh, override pattern, which in reality is just using props to pass additional things. Like this is not a completely new um, approach. So if you ever used, I guess, more, uh, how do I put it? An object props, let's put it this way, to override the defaults inside of your components that you pretty much know what is happening here. But the, yeah, the general idea is very simple. The, that you provide in this case, they, uh, this is the blog from the Uber uh, engineering. And what they did is they standardized it in sort of a way that they always have this overrides property to which you can pass in an object which would contain overrides for a specific uh, parts of the component. So in this case for autocomplete, they, for example, they override the props on the root. They override the style on the root and they have additional options component that is a custom option, right? Uh, which is a quite nice pattern. I I guess the uh, whole overrides thing is makes sense when you know when you have a lot of components and you need a way to standardize that. But I personally prefer just doing that with the separate properties because I, I, I mean, I guess my components are just not complex enough to justify the whole thing. But the pattern itself is really cool. So if you are working on a UI components and wanted to give the users of your components more way to customize them, then this is definitely one to look out for. So I would uh, highly recommend reading this through if you are not familiar with the pattern. All right, and the last article we got here today is from Dan Abramov's overreacted blog. Uh, the article is called The Elements of UI Engineering, and it actually stemmed from the previous post from Dan that we looked uh, at in the previous podcast uh, that was called The Things I Don't Know as of 2018. Uh, for whatever reason, that old post, um, I don't know, aggroed, I guess, a bunch of people who were saying that Dan is not a real engineer because he doesn't know all of those things. And I mean, if you look at the list of things he doesn't know, it's insane. Like, I don't know. I know some of them, but I don't think any person could actually know all of that. Maybe he can, but, you know, on a very basic level, but this is not what you want to be, right? So the Dan goes over, uh, there was, first of all, there was a lot of discussions on Twitter and I guess this blog post resulted in this, you know, as a continuation of those discussions. But basically what he talks about is that he's saying, okay, so um, instead of knowing all of those things, here's what I know about the building UIs because this is his primary area of expertise, right? And here are the problems that he knows how to solve. And he knows like this is what his sort of knowledge areas, right? Which Makes perfect sense. And a lot of those are, well, I, I probably wouldn't know how to solve half of them because I'm not a UI person, right? But it goes the same for anyone else. For example, if you take someone who's not working in data science and show him my problems, he's likely not gonna be able to solve this, right? So it's, it's very interesting to read through all of those and uh, to see how the problems that you think are relatively simple, like for example, consistency of the UIs, right? can turn out to be very, very complicated if you look at the 
large UIs like Facebook, right? So you would think, you know, there's a like button and the text updates to you and three other friends, um, friends like this post. You think that's okay, this is very simple, but um, as the Dan outlines, there might be like several places where when this visual indicator exists or, you know, how do we handle navigating between pages and so on and so forth. And all of those problems, while the title seems, you know, relatively simple, responsiveness, latency, navigation, staleness, entropy, priority, accessibility, internationalization, delivery, resilience, abstraction, like all of this is, you know, something that we basically work with on a daily basis. But then I start reading about those tiny details that he outlines here and you start thinking, okay, this is actually not as simple as I thought it was, which is absolutely fascinating and really cool to read about. So yeah, give it a read. It's a really good um, think piece. Again, uh, if you're curious, look up at Dan's Twitter and see all the discussions going about things he doesn't know. It is kind of crazy, but um, yeah. Anyway, quite recommend it. All right, I think that is actually it uh, for the articles. Now we got some tiny bit sized awesome things. First one is this article talking about how Doomfire was implemented in the Doom engine. But in this case, actually the author implemented it in JavaScript. So you can actually see the JavaScript code, uh, the very basic canvas that walks you through implementing this fire, you know, in a pixelated state, pixel by pixel and animating it, which looks quite nice actually, to be honest. So if you are ever curious how the graphics were done in an old school way, do check it out. I mean, the code is very trivial, but it's uh, pretty neat nonetheless. So do check this one out. Next thing we got here is the tweet from uh, Mr. Gettify, uh, who said, I had some code implemented and fully tested, almost ready to release. Then I was writing the documentation for it and I realized the code's behavior is wrong and should be changed. Test-driven development wouldn't have saved me here. Docs are equally as important as the test and designing software. Um, I just thought uh, this, this absolutely has been striking closer and closer um, to home for me, you know, as, as I build more complex things, especially more focused things, let's put it this way, because sometimes you start thinking about the software from, you know, the logic perspective, and then you actually start writing documentation describing how the others should use it. And it turns out you did something entirely wrong and this is not how it should have been working. I already stumbled upon this problem many times and um, yeah, as he outlines test-driven development or even, you know, 100% test coverage or whatever wouldn't actually help you in this case because you don't think about your piece of software or library or whatever as uh, as a thing that someone else would use, but you think of it as just a bunch of algorithms, right? So um, the idea of, there's actually some really interesting comments in the thread of uh, this thread in discussion. So you would, I would recommend looking through that. Uh, for example, the Ben Lash here from, uh, I think he's one of the co-authors of the RxJS or co-developers. Uh, and Angular as well, he says that the, uh, they typically design docs first with reviewers because it saves a lot of headaches because then you know what exactly has to be done and how exactly it should work, which is a very interesting approach and something I would will probably try in the upcoming projects. So quite highly recommend it. Uh, look through the thread. There is a lot of very interesting discussion going on. Next tiny bit we got here is the teaser from the uh, NPM team from uh, maybe cats. Uh, NPM Tink now works with TypeScript and ESM modules out of the box, no config required. Same goes for JS6. And um, essentially you can use Tink and execute the uh, TypeScript script and it will just work out of the box without any additional configurations, which is kind of great. So I am really looking forward to Tink at least beta release. So I would actually jump on beta and try it out. I know they're still in very early alpha and there's a lot of like, you know, rough edges essentially, but this project looks quite great. So I'm very looking forward to that. All right, next thing we got here is the new feature in Firefox Dev Edition. When you inspect the Flexbox item, the uh, sidebar now actually shows the diagram illustrating the basis shrink grow and min max for the Flexbox item. So you can actually see how small it was before it started growing or, you know, shrinking or whatever. And then you can see the flexibility in pixels uh, showing how much it changed, which sounds like immensely useful feature actually, because I've always had problems with the flex boxes and figuring out what the hell happened to my div. So this, this is kind of great. I cannot wait to try this out. All right. Next thing we got here is the 
a um, short thread that discusses the demo of uh, Angular IV based uh, server side rendering, uh, like up with the server side rendering, that actually went beyond route splitting. And when the app is server side rendered, you actually get zero JavaScript overhead. So there's literally no JavaScript served until you click on element that should be interactive. So that once you click on it, the element gets hydrated from the server, as in the JavaScript is fetched and you know all, everything is set up, uh, which means that you will only load and execute the JavaScript that actually user actually wanted, which is basically next level of sp code splitting, right? So the very basic one is route splitting, and now we have the component splitting with automated hydration, which is insane. Um, there's also Adios Money here in thread saying, okay, it will be really cool to look at that and then uh, do low priority prefetching JS that is needed to, you know, minimum interaction to minimize perceived latency, which sounds even better. So I'm kind of excited to see where all of this goes because getting websites that render without JavaScript at all and then load JavaScript once you want to interact is freaking amazing. And I'm honestly all for this. So it's kind of kind of great. Uh, there's a code with a demo if you're interested. So it uses this Angular IV engine, the new one. I don't, I don't remember if they actually released it or not. But so the code is open source. It's a very early built and contrived example, as the author says. But uh, very interesting, nonetheless. Do check it out. All right. Next thing we got here is uh, enabling dark mode on websites based on surrounding lights. Uh, it's essentially a very small snippet of code that shows off a feature that I didn't know existed. So apparently you have, uh, from the browser, you have access to ambient light sensor API that allows you to detect the lighting, you know, from ambient sensor exactly. So you can actually switch your um, theme, like a lot of mobile apps do from dark to light, uh, just by using some JavaScript and do it on your website, which is kind of neat. So if you ever wanted to do that, do check it out. It's kind of cool. I am not sure about the support. Oh, there's a can I use link, which is always handy. Um, I'm guessing it's gonna be supported. Well, okay, it's not very well supported actually. It's, it seems like it's literally only supported in Firefox for Android and is behind the flags in Chrome, which is a bit sad, but still kind of neat that this API exists. So do check it out. I mean, it's it, it has the W3C spec, so I assume it's gonna come uh, editor's draft. Yeah, so it's probably gonna come to the browsers in the near future. Uh, pretty neat nonetheless. All right. Now we have the releases section. There's literally just one release this week around. Again, you know, Christmas and New Year and everything, people weren't really doing much, but uh, that's actually a surprising amount of content this, <laughs> this week as well. So I'm uh, actually quite amazed. So Mr. Getify here released the version four of TNG hooks like React hooks, but uh, for non-React functions. And there's now a use effect hook. So uh, I think that actually brings it to all the hooks that you have in React, but for normal functions. I still don't know why would I use that anywhere as in, you know, I just hadn't had a use case for it, but maybe you do. So do check it out. It is quite neat. Uh, and the fact that it exists just, you know, makes me very happy for some reason. All right, that is it for releases. Now we are coming to the uh, libraries and demos section. And the first one I want to highlight is the game of 2018, the game competition hosted by GitHub that happened in December. It is finished and there is now a list of all the games that uh, participated as well as the results and winners and everything. And you can just try it out yourself. So there are some really cool things. Like one of my favorite ones is this um, falling through code. I don't remember if there were any demos around. I don't think so. So basically the idea is that you can fall through code in any repository and this actually set up as a game, which is kind of neat. And a lot of people complain that the um, license disclaimers on top uh, actually break the game because they are too long. <laughs> but it is kind of neat. So if you are curious about, you know, what can you build in one month uh, to compete in the game jam, do check it out. There are some really cool things. Right, next one. This is probably my favorite demo of the week. This is a Doom 3 demo. So this is not a full Doom 3, but just a demo of it, but it's still, you know, the same source code. So if you didn't know, the source code for Doom 3 is published on GitHub. And the Doom 3 demo assets are also available um, under the, well, kind of permissive license, I guess. So um, some crazy person took Doom 3 and compiled it to WebAssembly. So what you see right here is Doom 3, like the complete game, 
running in my browser. And um, I can literally click a button. It's It might hang for a bit, like it does, it's a ton of RAM. It does require a very powerful CPU. And I think it uses WebGL, so it's not, you know, not that impactful to uh, GPU. But you can play Doom 3 demo in your browser with the mouse locking and everything. And there's like the music. So I disabled the sounds for now, obviously, so that, you know, it doesn't distract us. But all of that stuff is actually working. Um, it's not the old game, as I said, so you cannot legally do that. But the demo assets is in, I think it's like first two levels or something. They are available uh, for free to everyone. I, I think it's like, you know, attribution license or something. So basically the author just took the assets and rebuilt the engine and uh, there you go. And, and you know, it's, it literally works. It work, you, can, you can do everything. Like you can, you can talk to people, you can run around and the FPS, I mean, it's not terrible. Like um, the only problem is that uh, the Doom 3 looked really good because they had some crazy shaders uh, going on around. And the problem is those shaders don't really translate that well to WebGL. So uh, what you see here is that some there are some minor issues with lightning and, uh, you know, it doesn't look as impressive as the original games because the shaders are not actually um, translated properly, right? So because I, I guess it was like a weekend project or something. But even the fact that I can launch my browser and play a Doom 3 in it without, you know, installing anything or whatever is just blowing my mind. Yes, it is WebGL and WebAssembly essentially, which, I mean, just look at this stuff. All of this is working without any, like there's even cutscenes and stuff. It is insane. Uh, yeah, you can try it out yourself. So it basically requires any browser with WebAssembly and that's basically it. Um, I think it will probably work on some very beefy tablets. As I said, the main problem with it right now is that it actually requires, yeah, 1.2 gigs of RAM because it has to load all that stuff in and it eats 100% of my pretty beefy CPU. It actually has a console in it as well. <laughs> Holy crap, I did not know that, okay. But yeah, it's, it's very impressive and very cool. So if you're curious, do check it out. All right. Next demo we have here is also quite awesome. Uh, it's called RR Web, uh, record and replay the web. And it's a tiny tool that allows you to, well, record and replay web. Uh, you might be wondering what the hell is that? And uh, well, uh, let me, where was the demo for it? Wait a second, there was, uh, yeah, that was the, uh, wait a second. There was a very impressive thing somewhere that I clicked last time. And it literally had, was it on this page? Wait a second, or was it the, no, that was the conversational form Tetris game. Ah, oh, God, where did I, was it there a I No. Oh, is it because my screen is too small? No, that's also not, okay. But basically the idea is that you can actually record any actions you take on the web and then replay them interactively. Um, so, here, for example, I think it, yeah, I think it's breaking a bit because of my scaling in a browser. So the thing is that last time uh, here, I had, a, let me refresh it, maybe, maybe it just realigns itself. So when I tried it on the full screen, it actually worked way better. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure why is it all broken up right now. Let me try to, you know what, let me try to maybe drag it out a bit like this. Uh, so chat, sorry, will not see it for a second, but, um, yeah, okay, so there seems to be something uh, wonky going on with my browser. But the idea is that it actually replaying the actions that user took, right? And the cool thing is that what you see here is an actual page that you can interact yourself. So you not just see the actions, but you actually see the stuff happening in real time and you can um, interact with it. Um, I'm not sure what happened to the... I, I saw the example that was working for me just before the podcast, but either they changed the website or there's like, I don't think my ad block is blocking anything. Maybe, maybe this. Ah, there we go. Okay, now it works. Right, there you go. So this is the replay. Um, okay, wait a second. Let me just realign the thingy over. No, come on. No. So this, this what you see here, right, is um, the replay and it shows you the GitHub. So the cool thing, is 
this is the actual GitHub. So I can actually click on this and it will open it in a new tab. If I click play, it will play the actions and show the stuff. And again, I can pause it at any moment, click on something and it will open in a new tab because what you see right here is a full page, which is insane. So um, it's a really impressive bit of tech. And if that sounds interesting, I would highly recommend checking it out. All right. Continuing, we got the next thing. Uh, the Facebook just open sourced their JavaScript inter... <laughs> this word is killing me. JavaScript internationalization framework uh, called FBT. Uh, it's obviously, as you might imagine, built for uh, React, but I think you can also use it for the other things. Uh, but yeah, um, I mean, basically it's just, you know, another Intel framework. Uh, this one is used in React, oh, sorry, in Facebook internally which is kind of, you know, says a lot about the um, usability and the application of this one. So if you are doing something with Intel, do check this one out. Maybe you like this more than what you're currently using. It comes with the Babel plugins and Babel runtimes. Also has all the tools that you would expect to see in the Intronization framework, including the automated, uh, automated extraction of the translations, and translating and cleaning and all basically there's like a lot of uh, related tooling. All of that is done, it seems through the Babel plugin FBT. For some reason it has binaries I, that, that looks a bit weird, but you know, I guess it's like, yeah. All right, um, continuing, we got the node security. This is also one of my favorite ones this week probably. So you remember that article we looked at a couple of uh, weeks ago, I think that talked about uh, adding NPM package permissions, right? So to tackle this issue where you install third party NPM code and you don't know what it's gonna do. And then like, you know, the logger, for example, doesn't need access to a HTTP module or even maybe even file system if you just log to console. So um, the author here, Matt Hayward, implemented the module code Node Security, which essentially overrides the require in Node to provide these features. So the way it works is you require your node security, you create a new instance, right? And then you can specify the config. So you can even uh, change the core modules, uh, which are allowed to run. And then you can control the specific uh, permissions on a module basis. So in this case, for example, for Axios, we allow HTTP and HTTPS and everything else is gonna be disallowed, right? So it's got globally disabled, which is kind of, really cool. I am so um, the whole module is awesome. And I would want to see that in the node core, right? So uh, the interesting thing is, uh, first of all, I'm curious about the overhead that it adds like on one hand, yeah, it's just, you know, essentially the loader itself. Uh, I think you no, know, this is the, the module loader is just an hijack of a require, right? So we just change the uh, um, change how the require works, but I'm curious how much overhead does it adds and how it's gonna perform in the benchmarks. But if you are working in a very sensitive environment as in you don't want anything breaking, this is really cool approach. So do check this out. I'm also curious if the node team will look at that and maybe implement something similar because having that in core would be amazing. All right, next library we have here is a new version of React to Sync. So this actually, I haven't covered it before, but it's, it's you know, sort of a quite, I mean, it's, it's been around for quite some time now. It's a promise-based React data loader that had a declarative API as in you had the component that you can pass in the function to and then you use the render props to get the data later on. The cool thing is that, well, we get the React hooks coming up quite soon and they just added the hooks API, which make it about 20 times easier to use. So instead of wrapping everything in render props, you can now literally just use, um, where is it? Use the sync. There you go. So you can now literally just say use the sync and pass a promise and parameters and you will get the data back as the objects, right? So you don't even await. Uh, yeah, I don't know, see you around. Uh, yeah, so this is like, I cannot wait for hooks to come fast enough to the React. I mean, they should be shipped in the next weeks, I guess, because they were teasing them for quite some time now. 
But yeah, this is really, really awesome. Um, right, continuing, we got learn JSON web tokens repo. So this is not exactly a library, it's more of a tutorial, I guess. But I just thought I put this in this section because it's a very comprehensive guide to JSON web tokens that explains basically everything about it, what kind of uh, features does it has, well, how does the formatting look, you know, the header, the payload, the signature, the claims, something that a lot of people actually are not aware even exists in, in uh, JVDs, for example, and then talks about using that in, you know, servers, and then there's some commonly asked questions, how to invalidate stuff, uh, and then there's like uh, secret keys usage and whatever, and then there's some packages and a bunch of further readings. So if you were curious about JSON Web Tokens, but you were not sure where to start or you know we're looking for a comprehensive guide then do check this one out it is quite damn good all right next thing we got here is uh vpk vpec i'm not sure how to read that i guess it's wpk a friendly intuitive intelligent and unofficial command line interface for webpack so i guess people finally got tired of you know webpack requiring a tons of configuration and decided to uh, fix it before the webpack team does it which i think they're actually working on a next version of Webpack, which would include um, good defaults and then less configuration essentially. But yeah, I guess people don't want to wait. So this is sort of uh, one of the two libraries that I have to show you today that sort of try to tackle the Webpack complexity. This one does it in a way that it basically configures the Webpack for you. So you can, you can use commands like, you know, init, add, set, get, and opts to actually manage the config from the command line directly. So you can use like WPK add and then add a plugin loader or whatever, and it will do everything for you, which is kind of neat. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I'm a fan of this approach. I actually looking at the Webpack, I don't think I've ever used it in the past year without relying on something like Next.js or, you know, Gatsby or whatever, anything that basically has it baked in, right? So I don't want to touch it myself now. If I would pick a loader, I would pick a par parcel because it's just really good and doesn't require any, basically any configuration, right? So, but uh, nonetheless, pretty interesting project. Next one we have is called Jetpack and it's also a Webpack made more convenient. Uh, so this takes a different approach. It's sort of tries to convert Webpack into parcel, if I would put it, uh, you know, in my own words. And the idea is that it basically has sensible defaults, pre-configured Babel with uh, Babel preset env and preset react, what you would typically use it, post CSS pre-configured, uh, CSS modules available with one flag, automatic JSX detection, hot reloading built in, and then a bunch of other features that it would basically expect from the uh, you know typical project you set up. Once again, I if I would need to use Webpack and configure it myself, I would probably just go for Parcel because it's just, you know, easier to use. Um, maybe you will like this one more, so just check it out. It's, and they're very, both of those are very early stages projects, but I do like the idea that we're going from, hey, we actually need like, you know, 200 lines command uh, config files to actually run something to stuff like Parcel where you literally don't have any config and it just works out of the box with TypeScript, Babel, whatever the hell you imagine which is kind of awesome. So yeah, more of this, please. All right, next thing we got here is Form.js, experimental data flow analysis tool for JavaScript. Uh, right, so what this does is it allows you to trace back any value on the page from the DOM to the script file. So you can actually see where this value was injected from into the HTML, right? Which is very useful for dynamic applications. Um, as the people talking were talking on the discussion of this thing, it was like, so what is the use case for this? And the author was like, well, I'm not sure myself, but it was just a nice experiment, which sounds exactly perfect. But it, like, I don't know, maybe you know the use case for it. I just think that the fact that this exists is really awesome. The fact that you can actually, there's a tool that allows you to trace where the value was last set from in a specific DOM node in a very complex JavaScript app is kind of awesome. Maybe even if for just reverse engineering, right? So I imagine the most like simplest use case would be reverse engineering the software and looking exactly how it works, right? So if you are interested, do check it out. It's open source and everything. It looks kind of pretty neat. All right. Next library we got here is called Duix and it's a state manager focused on keep it stupid simple principle and uh, Pareto's principle. 
It's a very basic, um, I think it's also a singleton store, essentially. The idea is that you get three minutes, get set and subscribe. Um, the problem, like, you know, it's very straightforward. There's nothing really much to tell here about. The problem I have with this kind of um, stores, like 99% of the time is first of all, it's a singleton, so I cannot have more than one, right? And sometimes it's just needed. Second of all, this subscribe unsubscribe pattern is not very nice. Like I've, I, I'm used to that. Like I used to do that with RxJS and React, but like this stuff is just not pretty, right? So you have to essentially manage the subscription manually, but I guess maybe with the React hooks coming out, that would be a bit simpler. Maybe you wanted something very simple and very stupid, and this is exactly what it is. So it's a very straightforward uh, state management solution. But then again, I would suggest going for something like unstated, to be honest. But yeah. All right. Next thing we got here is a Material UI system, the new release from the Material UI team. Uh, I think this is the guys from Google, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, it is Google. No, wait. This is actually React components for Material. Okay, so I'm confusing them. So this is the material components for React, and they just released the Material UI system uh, sub package, I guess. And it's a bunch of style functions that allow you to build your own powerful design systems. So the idea is that you know you're not always want to use exactly what is given, and then modifying the styles for existing UI components can be a pain in the ass. So they provide a declarative way of writing your own design systems that you can then export as your own component UI set, right? And then reuse them in your app, which is a neat approach. So I can't really complain about that. Again, you know, I'm not the exactly the person to talk about this as I'm not doing that much of a UI. But if you are, if you are doing a lot of UI and if you are interested in all that stuff, do check it out. Seems to be quite nice and very well designed. But then again, you know, not exactly an expert, so don't take my word for it. All right, and the last demo we got here today is the learn JavaScript.online. As the title says, the easiest way to learn and practice modern JavaScript. And it's a website that essentially allows you to uh, just learn and, and write JavaScript in your browser with automated unit tests that tells you when you are correct or not, and the integrated console that tells you what exactly happened when you uh, changed the code, which is kind of neat. And uh, this is also very similar to what I wanted to do with that JavaScript game we started building hell knows when, like a couple of months ago. I still want to finish that. And I still think we can make it more fun than just, you know, basic JavaScript and turn it into a proper game like um, Exabots. But uh, wait, was it Exabots? Uh, Exa, what's the name of it? You know what I mean, the Zactronic game, basically. Any Zactronic game, to be honest. But it is nonetheless quite cool and it is, I think it's completely free. So you can just sign in with a GitHub and um, go for it. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work on mobile devices, but yeah, if you wanted to um, improve your JavaScript or maybe learn from scratch, do check it out. All right, that is actually it for the libraries and demos. I got some more uh, interesting and silly things, uh, actually more interesting things this time around. So the first one is that the Microsoft uh, started developing and introducing the alternate interview framework that actually sounds quite amazing. So instead of doing the traditional whiteboarding and all that kind of bullshit, they switch to a framework that basically involves, uh, first of all, they always have two interviewers at a time. They share the questions ahead of time and they work on actual problems the team is facing, not, you know, like abstract algorithms or whiteboard questions or whatever that is 99% doesn't really matter uh, in the real work you do, right? And they also have the blind feedback, which is also kind of great. So uh, from what I've heard from, you know, discussions, it's not implemented across the whole company yet. So it's just a couple of departments. But the fact that they are actually doing that is kind of amazing. So sharing questions ahead of time and working on actual problems I, this is probably one of the best ways to, you know, figure out if the person you're going to hire knows his stuff, because let's be honest, if you ask someone to whiteboard, or if you ask someone a question they don't know and don't allow them to Google, you probably, I mean, I will fail. I can tell you immediately, right? So if you ask me to do something on a whiteboard without access to Google, I will not be able to make it. I'm terrible at remembering things, right? But why would I be? Because I Google everything. Uh, it's kind of amusing to see people in comments who say that 
uh, sharing questions in advance is actually bad because then you don't see how a person reacts to, uh, you know, surprising questions. Right? Why? When, when did you had a surprising question or surprising problem at your work last time? Unless you're working in research and development, then it's a completely different question, you know. But it's like, yeah, some weird stuff going on. But it's it's really cool. So I would want to see more companies uh, doing that because this sounds like a really cool way of uh, testing the candidates. Actually, I would want to also see the more detailed write up maybe from someone at Microsoft on how exactly they do that, and maybe even detail and publish the framework itself so that other companies can reuse that. I will be all in for that because that sounds awesome. All right, uh, next thing I want to highlight. So there was a uh, 35th uh, Chaos Creation Club in Leipzig here, actually where I live. I uh, unfortunately wasn't able to participate this year, but they published all the videos they had, uh, all the talks they had in a video format. So as you can see here, there is a ton of them. And um, unfortunately for the rest of the world, there is quite a large number of the talks that are in German because it's a German conference. But um, I think more than a half are actually in English and there is some very, very cool things. For example, one of my favorite ones is this how Facebook tracks you on Android talk. And um, this is absolutely terrifying. So if you didn't know the Facebook tracks you on Android, even if you don't have any Facebook installed and but essentially by using Facebook SDK that is integrated into a third party apps. So what they discovered is that if you have a third party app that uses Facebook SDK, you don't even need to touch that SDK. So you don't even have to use the login with Facebook button. That app will still track you and send your data to Facebook. And that is beyond control of the app developers, which is absolute bonkers. So um, yeah, definitely recommend to look at this talk and see how Facebook is abusing um, essentially SDK features to track you through, well, basically everything possible, right? So I, I guess that doesn't really come as a surprise to anyone right now, but uh, yeah. There is a ton of really cool talks uh, related to hacking mostly, as you might imagine. Um, also quite a lot of privacy related talks this time around. Uh, but yeah, basically highly recommended. Just have a look. There is videos for just about everyone, I think. Uh, very, very diverse topics, very interesting stuff going on around and uh, the quality is quite good. Like sometimes they had some problems with microphones, but in general, it's it's okay. So yeah, do check it out. And the last uh, silly thing I got here today is, uh, yeah, Doom went golfing and exploring Roomba brains over the holidays. Um, apparently for, for some reason, so yeah, Doom is turned 25 years uh, last month. And for some reason, it's kind of getting the new life. Um, through the mods like uh, yeah, Doomba is the one that I highlighted uh, last time, right? When you can actually use Roomba to map your house and then play a Doom there, right? To make it into a Doom map, which which is silly as hell. But man, I really want to buy Roomba just for that, just just to play Doom <laughs> because of this shit. This is great. Uh, apparently, there's the Hellshots Golf multiplayer mod, multiplayer mod that allows you to play golf in Doom. There is as well, um, I've recently read about the mods for Doom that recreated uh, Metal Gear Solid in it. And it's crazy what people do with a game that is 25 years old. So if you're curious to check it out, there's like a bunch of links here to five or six different mods that are just as crazy as Doomba basically. And just as crazy as the Hellshots Golf. So yeah, check it out. It's kind of cool. All right, that is basically it for my side. Um, once again, you know, we were just basically off the holidays, not that many things happening, not that many articles, but uh, managed to find some cool stuff for you. So as usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub, the link is in the description. Uh, if you missed the whole podcast, you can uh, listen to it on YouTube or Spotify or CastBox or Dev2 or whatever the hell you prefer. Once again, the links are in the description below. If you think I missed any links or you have something to share, do send it either right now in the chat or join our Discord server and share it with me over there or you know just join it to chat with us. There is a lot of people who are more than happy to help you with your JavaScript problems, including me, and just happy to talk about the new things that are out in the wild. Or maybe, you know, uh, look at your new awesome library uh, for state management in React that you just came up with, you know. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Doesn't seem like we have anything in chat. So um, I guess that's basically it for today. 
So once again, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. I hope you are having an awesome 2019 so far. Um, yeah, basically have a great weekend and I see you next week. Bye.